even in the soft light from her nightstand. Angel could see the skin of her jaw, neck, and upper chest were modded, bright red, and unnaturally pale white. The skin was all puffy and angry looking. It looked like a rash, but not like a rash she'd ever seen before. Angel touched her inflamed skin. It felt weird, like it had a squishy texture. She stared at herself in horror. Oh, this was not good. Not good at all. Angel didn't like to think of herself as super wrapped up in how she looked, because that was something she hated about her mother. But she had to admit, she tended to take her looks for granted. She was pretty, and she knew it. She didn't use her looks to gain an unfair advantage or anything. She didn't let her looks turn in her into an idiot, either. Boys at school asked her out all the time, but she usually said no. She'd only dated a couple of guys, and she found them to be immature and grabby. She never let anything progress past a few dates. She never had a boyfriend, either. Dominic was the first boy she considered to be boyfriend material. But Angel's looks were an integral part of her plan to be a successful actress, singer, and dancer. She was going into an industry that valued looks almost even above talent. Getting some kind of weird skin condition a month before an acting workshop was the exact opposite of what she needed. She stared at the blotchy mass of bright red modules, uh, nodules on her skin, and as she watched, the redness spread. It was spreading fast. She could actually see it was creeping up from her jawline to the lower part of her cheek. Maybe it was some sort of rash from the horses at the ran on the stable. She had been feeling a little congested at the barn. Ophelia and her horrible father had taken everything from her. It only made sense they had been responsible for taking her health, too. Oh, stop. Please stop, Angel pleaded as she watched the ugliness fan outward from her jaw and creep up her lovely smooth cheeks. What could she do? Angel went to her door, listened, heard nothing, and carefully opened the door. As soon as the door was open, she could hear Myron's reverberant snores coming through the double doors to the master suite. The louder the blasts nearly vibrated the the louder blast nearly vibrated the whole, whole house. How did her mother sleep next to the man? With earplugs. That was how. Her mother bought the best earplugs money could buy. Ophelia was snoring, too. Her snores were like mini versions of her dad's. Angel tiptoed down the hall, went into the bathroom, shut the door as quietly as she could, and then turned on the bathroom light. Ugly gold wall sconces, way too formal for a suburban house flanked an equally ornate framed mirror. She again faced her reflection. She almost screamed, but clapped a hand over her mouth and whimpered instead. In just the few minutes it had taken her to get from the room to the bathroom, the rash had spread farther up her cheeks and down her chest. Angel turned on the water and grabbed for soap. Maybe if it was a rash, if she cleaned the rest of the dust and dander from her skin, it would stop any further advancement. She started to soap up a washcloth, then she looked at her hair. Dominic had cleaned her hair, and her skin for that matter. What had been in that plastic bottle? It had been more than water. It had a floral smell. What if the solution in the bottle was toxic? It was from Freddy's. It wouldn't have surprised Angel at all if something was wrong with it. She needed to take a shower. Turning off the faucet, Angel turned around to turn on the shower, and she stripped out of her clothes. She hoped everyone was sleeping deeply enough not to hear the shower. She was pretty sure they were. Even if they weren't, it didn't matter. She had to get off whatever crud she'd picked up at Freddy's. Angel got in the marble shower and let hot water sluice over her. She reached for the shampoo and poured more over her head, her head than she'd ever used in her life. She proceeded to scrub herself harder than she ever had. She scrubbed so hard it hurt, and she scrubbed so hard her skin bled. When she saw a trickle of red going down the drain, she would realized she had gone too far. She rinsed thoroughly and toweled off. She wrapped herself in another dry towel. Before she faced the mirror again, Angel took a deep breath. Please, she begged. Please be better. Closing her eyes, she moved over to the mirror. She faced it, and she opened her eyes. She immediately started breathing hard, almost hyperventilating. Her heart pounded out a panic rhythm of what felt like 300 beats per minute. Angel's legs went out from under her, and she sank down onto the fluffy white bath mat. She started to cry as her mind replayed the hideousness she had seen in the mirror. The rash was on both cheeks now, and it was moving upward. It had reached the bottom of her cheekbones already. The rash was moving down, too. It covered most of her ch chest, and had spread to her shoulders. It must have gone so fully into her system that washing did no good. What could she do now? 
Angel started to put her head in her hands, but she stopped herself. What if it got in her hands too? Angel looked wildly around the room, as if some solution to her problem was going to present itself. None did. What do I do? She asked. She didn't know whom she was asking, but for some reason, she got an answer. Angel snapped her fingers and crawled over to the vanity cabinet under the sink. She threw doors open and began pawing through the first aid and other supplies stored there. She thought, yes, there it was. A few months ago, Ophelia got poison ivy, and Angel's mom bought calamine lotion. Maybe that would help. Angel flung aside bottles and boxes in the cabinet until she could reach the bottle of pinkish liquid. She grabbed it, opened it, and began slathering herself with calamine. When she was done, she sat on the floor and tried to calm her breathing. In through her nose. One, two, three. Out through her mouth. One, two, three. She did this ten times and told herself everything was okay. The itching wasn't as bad, she didn't think. That was good, right? Angel sat and breathed some more. She could feel her heart slowing. It's going to be okay, she told herself. Everything is fine. You just have a little rash from the stuff in that bottle. Not that different, really, from getting a poison ivy rash. Ophelia had just, like, had survived that just fine. Angel would be fine too. Angel realized she was getting cold. She reached into the cabinet for a third towel. That's when she saw that the rash could now be seen on her upper arms, well below the edge of the now crusty calamine lotion. No! Angel gasped. She jumped up, her heart hammering again. She looked in the mirror. Her mouth dropped open. Not only was the rash spreading well beyond where she'd put the calamine lotion, but the rash looked different now, too. Was the calamine making it worse? Angel got back in the shower and rinsed off all the lotion, getting out again and wrapping herself in a new towel. She forced herself to return to the mirror. A shriek of terror caught in her throat. She, stared, she started to shiver uncontrollably. She was turning into a lizard, a slimy, squishy-looking lizard, from beneath her eyes, down her entire face and neck and chest, and now moving lower on her arms. Ge Gelatinous-looking scales were forming on her skin. The scales were red and gray and pink, and they looked moist and spongy, even though she just dried herself off. Angel was horrified, but also unable to look away from the horror unfolding in her mirror. What was it? She examined her arm, and she carefully touched one of the gooey scales. It felt springly, like a rubbery pillow, kind of viscous to the touch. It kind of felt like a wet gumdrop. Angel sucked in air. Could this have something to do with that stupid gumdrop nose? She closed her eyes and ground her teeth together. This was all Ophelia's fault. If she had had her stupid party and gone that stupid nose, Angel was like, stupid nose. Angel could have had an allergic reaction to the nose. What was in it? Wait, allergic reaction. Whether it was the gumdrop nose or not that caused it, Angel could have been having an allergic reaction. That was easy enough to fix, right? Angel turned and crossed the bathroom to the wall cabinet next to the door. This was where her mother kept over-the-counter medicines that she didn't want Ophelia getting into. Surely they had some antihistamines. Angel opened the cabinet door and sorted frantically through the boxes, bottles, and vials. Yes! Angel spotted a box of antihistamines, and she didn't even bother to read the dosage instructions. She took three of them. Then she sat on the toilet seat and waited. She didn't know how long to wait. How long did it take for these things to start working? She sang softly while she waited. She sang, she sang three full songs. Her eyelids started to feel heavy. Didn't antihistamines made you feel drowsy? If so, that meant the pills were working. Excited, Angel stood to look in the mirror again. She again had to cover her mouth so she wouldn't scream. Her eyelids weren't heavy because she was drowsy. Her eyelids were heavy because they were now covered with the sticky scales. So was most of her forehead and the rest of her arms. Making sure her towel was securely tucked around her, Angel grabbed her discarded clothes, slapped off the bathroom light, threw open the bathroom door, and ran down the hall toward her room as quietly as she could. She couldn't handle this on her own. She needed to get to a hospital. She had to get dressed, and she didn't want to put on the clothes she just took off. They could be infected. She probably shouldn't even be carrying them, but it was too late now. As she passed her mom in Myron's room, she hesitated. She wondered if she would wake them. No. No way. What was wrong with her? Were the gloopy scales spreading to her brain, too? If she, if she had normal parents, loving parents, of course, she'd go to them for help. But she had her useless mother, and she had Myron. She had the two people most responsible for everything wrong in her life. 
They were the jerks who wouldn't help her with college because they were too busy spoiling her brat of a stepsister. No way was she going to ask them for help. In effect, she had no family. She was alone. Angel slipped into her room and leaned back against the door. Should she call one of her friends? She didn't have what she'd call a BFF, but she hung out with a lot of kids in the drama department. One of them might help her. As soon as she had the idea, she dismissed it. She didn't want those people to see her like this. They might help, but they'd also see her situation as an opportunity. Looking like this, she wasn't going to be able to perform the final spring performances. No, her friends would be more likely to gloat over her predicament than help her with it. And what about her teachers? No, same thing. They were supportive, but their support had to do a lot with her looks. She couldn't let them see her like this. She saw herself in the ER all by herself. All by herself, but surrounded by dozens of strangers. ERs were busy places. Did she really want to be seen like this in a crowded place? Absolutely not. No, the, a the ER wasn't the place for her. She shouldn't go to the hospital. If something from Freddy's was causing this, there was only one thing to do. Dropping her pile of clothes, Angel carefully poked in the pockets until she found Dominic's card. Here, she thought he was a great ca guy. She should have known better. Why did she think someone who worked at the nasty pizzeria could be a good guy? Dominic wasn't good. He worked for the awful place that made her sick. Well, now he was going to have—he was going to have to help her. She'd make him help her, and he was going to get a piece of her mind too. What kind of crud was in Freddy's anyway? Were the food and the candy poisoned? Was the water full of toxins, germs? Did she pick up a virus there? Angel ran to the hallway side table and grabbed the phone. Please be there. She breathed as she dialed Freddy's number. He did say he could always call her, but also, and but she also wasn't sure what time the arcade closed. It was really late. Dominic answered on the third ring. Freddy Fazbear's peep, he began. What did you do to me? Angel snapped before he could finish. Angel, is that you? Yes, it is me. And yes, it's me. Or at least it is for now. But I don't know how longer I'm going to be me. I'm sorry. Can you slow down? I think I might be missing something. You're not making sense. What did you have in that horrible place? She wanted to shout, but she didn't want anyone to wake up, so she asked her questions in quiet, clipped tones. Can we back up? I feel like I got a train in the middle of its run, and I don't know where it started, and I don't know where it's going. Stop trying to be clever. I'm not being clever. In fact, I think I'm pretty dense. I really don't know what you're talking about. Can you please start at the beginning? I should have known you weren't any different than any other guy. And other guys, sure, you seem different, but you were just playing games, weren't you? What did you do to me? Dominic sighed. Angel, please tell me what's going on. I'm turning into a slimy, squishy, disgusting lizard is what's going on. I have these putrid scales spreading all over me. Angel thought she heard Dominic groan, but she didn't stop talking. That's, what go that's what's going on, and it has to have of something to do with being at Freddy's today. It could have been whatever you had in that plastic bottle, maybe? Or something in the food, or candy, or... You tell me! Something at Freddy's did this. Dominic was silent. He was still on the line. Angel could hear him breathing. Dominic? Dominic still didn't speak. Are you there? Angel asked. Another few seconds passed. I'm so sorry, Angel, he finally said. So you know, so you, you know what's wrong with me. You need to come to Freddy's, he said. You didn't answer me. Come to Freddy's, and I'll explain. His voice, already so smooth and deep, dropped even lower. It soothed her. She could feel her heart rate slow just a little. And I'll help you, Angel. Just get to Freddy's. Angel's fury at Dominic and the stupid pizzeria abated, enough for her to feel a spark of hope. You'll help me? Her voice sounded small, but she didn't care. Yes, I'll help you. Just come here to Freddy's. Okay. And Angel? Yeah? Hurry. Okay. Bye. Angel hesitated for just an instant, then said bye. Angel sat on the floor for several seconds, clutching the phone and listening to the dead air of the ended call. Dominic would help her, and maybe he had betrayed her after all. Maybe everything would be okay. Angel suddenly realized how much time she was wasting. She dropped the phone, jumped up, and ran back to her room. Angel yanked open beret drawers and pulled out fresh underwear, a bra, jeans, and a t-shirt. She threw on her her clothes as fast as she could, and she thrust her feet into her sandals. Okay, that was the easy part. Now she had to get to Freddy's. 
She couldn't walk. It was too far. Not to mention, she didn't want to be seen. She looked at the digital clock on her nightstand. It was 11.35 p.m. Dark. But it wasn't late enough for the streets to be totally deserted. She thought about biking, but even that would take her a long time. No. The dreadful jelly scales were spreading too fast. She needed to drive. She'd take her mother's sports car. She'd driven the car plenty of times. Sometimes, when Myron wasn't around, her mom would tell Angel she wanted to go on a drive, and she felt like being a chauffeur and being chauffeured. Angel loved driving the zippy car. She wished it were hers. So driving the car wasn't an issue, but getting it away from the house might be. Could she deactivate the alarm, get into the garage, open the door on the garage door, start the car, and leave without anyone waking up? She had to. She had to get this handled, or life was going to be totally ruined. Angel grabbed one of her scarves and wrapped it around her head, so it would obscure her face as much as possible. She tucked her hair behind her ears. Suddenly, Angel thought of the way Dominic had tucked her hair behind her ears. Her eyes filled with tears. It figured. Story of her life. I meet an amazing guy, and I start turning into a clammy reptile, she thought. Would Dominic still like her when she saw oh, oh, the way she looked now? Was he as one-dimensional as all the other guys she'd met? The ones whose interest only went skin deep? If he was, that was the end of it. Even if he wasn't, how could they go out with her looking like this? How long would it take for this to go away? Would it be gone by graduation, by the time she left for the summer workshop? Why couldn't things go Angel's way for a change? It really wasn't fair. By the time Angel got into her stepmother's bright yellow sports car, the squidgly reptile skin had completely covered Angel's arms. She assumed it was heading down her legs, too, because they felt funny. Her stomach felt strange as well. Kind of heavy. She noticed that when she sat down in the driver's seat of the car, she was shorter in the seat than, than she'd ever had before. She had to adjust the rearview mirror downward, and she usually had to adjust it upward because she was a little taller than her mom. When she noticed this, she lifted her shirt to see what was happening. She let out a little scream. Her stomach had gone so elastic that it was kind of collapsing in on itself when she sat down. Was she going to be able to get to Freddy's before she was too pliable to do anything at all? Angel backed down her way and down her driveway and pressed the button to close the garage door. Her neighborhood was an expanse of darkness broken up by outdoor porch lights. In the distance, a dog barked, but otherwise, the only sound was the car's engine. None of the houses near had lights in the windows. It didn't look like anyone was staying up late to see Angel taking her mother's car out for a spin. Good. Angel pointed the car in the direction of Freddy's, and she resisted the urge to stomp on the accelerator. Speeding through town wasn't the thing to do right now, so she drove, well, like an angel, careful to obey every traffic law so as not to draw any attention to herself. Being in the highly visible, expensive car made being unobtrusive and unobtrusive a little challenging even under normal circumstances and these weren't normal circumstances most of the trip was quiet and uneventful but a block from freddy's she had a scare waiting at a red light she had the grum grumble of some kind of muscle car come up next to the sports car she didn't look over but the driver of the car whistled and called out want to have some fun honey Angel clutched the steering wheel harder, or she tried to. When she couldn't get the grip she wanted, she looked down to see why. Oh no! Her fingers were turning into segmented chunks of mus mu mucus-like material that turned her stomach. They didn't even look human anymore. The driver in the car next to hers called out again, and she glanced at the driver's door to be sure the locks were engaged. She also lowered her hands to the bottom of the steering wheel so the driver couldn't see them in the relent endless intrusion of the streetlights. The guy in the muscle car kept up a rude, suggestive patter while the light stayed red. What was taking so long for it to change? Eventually, it turned green. The muscle car sped off. Angel let out her pent-up breath. She drove the rest of the way to Freddy's without encountering another vehicle. When Angel finally pulled her mom's little sports car into the parking spot closest to the front door of Freddy's, she looked round at the brightly lit lot. Thankfully, no other cars were in it. She was alone. Now scanning the area again, she opened the driver's door and headed towards Freddy's entrance. Before she got there, Dominic opened the door and looked out at her. Angel's steps faltered, even though she needed Dominic's help. She still didn't want him to see her this way. She looked down and let her hair fall forward over her face. Angel?
Dominic called. It's okay. Don't worry about how you look. I don't care about that. I just need you to hurry so I can help you. Angel glanced at Dominic through the veil of her hair. His expression was somber. His lips were pressed together, and his, his eyes looked red. Had he been crying? He really seemed to care. This made Angel trust him even more. She walked forward and put her malformed hand in his strong, prefer perfect one. Without any comment about her hand, or any of the rest of her, he led her into Freddy's. Come on, I'll take you to the back. Angel let Dominic pull her down the hall. She looked up. The place looked much different now than it had a few hours ago. Not just because it was empty and quiet, but because... Because why? Angel frowned. Was it the lighting? During the party, every light in the restaurant had been on. Now most of them were out, and the ones that were on were turned down to a dim setting. Every bright color in the place was muted. Shadows stretched down the hall ahead of her and created pockets of darkness along the walls and the ceiling. The effect was sombering, maybe even a little scary, taking a few tentative steps down the hall with Dominic. Angel could still see the pictures of the characters on the walls, but they looked less friendly now. Why was that? Was it the shadows? Or something else? Angel took a few more steps until she heard a weird clinking sound. Suddenly, scared for no good reason, she stopped. It's okay, Dominic said. It's just one of the animatronics doing daily maintenance. Angel nodded and began humbling forward again. She was feeling woozy. The edges of her vision started to get fuzzy, and her balance wavered. Was the restaurant getting darker? No. It was the same. The problem was her. She was starting to lose consciousness. Dominic! I'm having trouble seeing! Dominic put her arms around her and started moving her more quickly along the halls. He said something to her, but she didn't understand it. Something was wrong with her hearing now, too. It felt like she had cotton in her ears, and she was sinking toward the floor. Her legs were going limp. They wouldn't hold her up anymore. Dominic, help me! Dominic lifted her arms into his and her into his arms, and he began trotting down the hall. Suddenly, the lights were brighter, not by a lot, but a little. They didn't seem to reveal any of the surroundings, though. Angel's diminished vision was worsening even more. The walls and the floors going past her were taking on an amphimorphous quality. They were losing their edges and becoming indistinct, almost impressionistic. Angel tried to blink and bring a hand up to wipe, wipe her eyes, but her arms just swung loose at her sides. She couldn't get them to respond to her brain's commands. But really, what were her brain's commands? Her brain was mendering around as if her brain cells had turned into soft rubber. No, not rubber. She sensed they were turning into goo, like the gloppy clay stuff Ophelia liked to play with, smooshing it in between her fingers like melting cheese oozing out of a grilled cheese sandwich. Okay, Angel, we're here. I'm going to put you in something that's going to help you. Do you understand? Angel nodded, because she could suddenly hear again. Why? Maybe it was the relief? She was getting maybe it was the reef maybe it was the relief. She was getting the help she needed. Dominic knew what was going on. He said he'd explain it. He hadn't explained it, and she wanted him to, but mostly she just wanted him to make it stop. Maybe Dominic has an antelope. No, that isn't right. Antidote. That's what it is. She tried to talk again, but she couldn't. She could see again though. Like her hearing, her eyesight had miraculously cleared up. She blinked and she could clearly see that Dominic was getting ready to lower her into a box. It was such a pretty box. A shiny wood box. Its grain so swirly and lovely that Angel wanted to become part of the box. She wanted the box to embrace her, hold her, and keep her safe. As soon as she saw the box, Angel no longer cared about what was happening to her. She didn't care about why it was happening, either. She didn't need an explanation. She was where she was supposed to be. Dominic bent over and began to put Angel in the box, and she tried to speak again. She wanted to say thank you. All she could get out was, thank you. I know, I know, Dominic said. It's going to be okay. His voice sounded odd, broken, like he was crying. Angel felt moisture on her forehead when Dominic leaned over her. Tears. She wanted to tell him it was okay. She was in the box now. It was her box. It belonged to her, and she belonged to it. Angel felt something prying at her eyes and her mouth. She felt hands prodding the skin on her arms. It's okay, Angel, Dominic repeated. It will be just a few hours at most. A few hours until what? Angel hoped it was a few hours until she was all well. Wouldn't that be great? She had something she wanted to do. What was it? I'm here, Angel, Dominic said. You're not alone. Dominic, 
That's what she wanted to do. She wanted to go out with Dominic. If she was better in a few hours, she'd be able to go. Where were they going to? Do you feel anything? Dominic said. Angel wanted to answer that question. Yes, she felt things. She felt a hard surface beneath her body. She felt something cool under her head. She felt the warmth of the bright light shining down on her. She felt hands on her forehead. Close your eyes, Angel, Dominic said. Angel did what he told her to do. The light went away. The world went dark. She could still hear, but sounds were distorted, like she was floating in water, her ears just below the surface. There you go, Dominic said. It will be over soon. Good, Angel thought, and she let unconsciousness take her. Angel woke up abruptly, as if someone poked her or shouted at her. She was fully alert. That was good, wasn't it? She had a vague memory of being really out of it before she went to sleep. The rash had did something to her thinking. The rash! Did she still have it? Angel tried to sit up. She couldn't. She couldn't move at all. What was going on? She tried again. It felt like she was paralyzed. Not liking that feeling at all, Angel writhed and hit her, her forehead on something hard. She squirmed some more, and her elbows and knees whacked something hard. Not paralyzed, confined. And what? For several moments, Angel fought to get free of the box she was in. She lamented Ophelia's party, which she understood vaguely was responsible for where she was now. But then she stopped struggling. Angel told herself to stay calm. Take stock, then figure out what to do next. She scanned her body. It felt foreign, not familiar at all, but she could sense that she seemed to be in an upright position. She was standing? If she was, she was standing in some kind of... Uh, some kind of a box that was so tightly fit around her that she had no leeway to move. Angel's breathing quickened. She didn't like confined spaces. She opened her mouth to call out, but her mouth was covered with something. Tape? She couldn't get her lips to part. She couldn't feel her teeth either, and she was having a little trouble breathing. Her nose felt funny, like it was partially plugged with something. Angel was on the verge of panic when suddenly she felt a space open up beneath her feet. Then she felt the sensation of being lowered. Down, down, down. From what seemed like a great distance, she could hear the sound of children screaming. She recoiled. She hated the sound of screaming and children screaming. That sound always reminded her of her bothersome stepsister, Ophelia. Over and over of the screaming, Angel heard a musical fanfare and a booming announcer's voice. She couldn't make out all his words, but it sounded like he was talking about someone's birthday. And she heard, Grand Finale! Why did those words seem familiar? The children's screams turned into cheers and laughter, and Angel's eyes were suddenly assaulted by bright, bright lights and lots of dazzling colors. She tried to figure out where she was because she had the sense she had been here before, recently, but all she could see was the light and color, the sensation of being lowered, stopped, and now Angel could feel that she was hanging in midair. She felt her body swaying back and forth, back and forth. It was not a pleasant sensation, so she tried to control the motion by twisting herself this way and that. She also flailed her arms, and she was pleasantly surprised that she could. She was hanging, but at least she was no longer confined. She kicked out her legs, and she flexed her hands and feet. The announcer was saying something else. Angel caught the word yummy, but she couldn't work out the rest of what was being said. The children's clamor was getting louder, though. It felt like they were getting closer, too. Angel felt like she was being surrounded. She moved her body around some more, doing a sort of mid-air dance. She wondered if she could do a somersault. She tried. No. Something was attached to the top of her head. The announcer spoke again. His words were all run together, all mushy, until he got to his last three words. Angel heard those clearly. Ready, set, go! Julie smiled up at the announcer when he said, Ready, set, go. She took a step toward the gummy girl, oscillating from the ceiling. She was so... Oh, like, she so liked being the center of attention that she wanted to stretch out the moment. She turned to look out at her parents. They beamed at her. She waved at them. Happy birthday, Julie, her mom called out. Yay, birthday girl, her dad shouted. Julie grinned, and she leaned over to the gummy girl, dangling in front of her. She reached up a hand, grabbed the foot, and bit off the gummy's toe, and the, big to the gummy's big toe. Everyone join in, the announcer sang out. The other kids crowded around Julie, and they began eating up the swaying, squirmy, gummy candy that was unlike any other. So that is the end of Gumdrop Angel. So the next story will be called Sergio's Lucky Day. So I hope you've enjoyed this audiobook.
and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.